It's a great pleasure to be with you again. My name is Jason Dexter, and today we are continuing our study in the book of Revelation. We're in Revelation chapter 16, verses 8 through 21. In the last chapter, we saw the beginning of the bull judgments, the last set of seven judgments, which God pours out his wrath upon a rebellious world. In today's lesson, we are going to look at verses 8 through 21 of chapter 16, where we see the fourth through the seventh bull judgments. We have seen in these judgments God's justice, of course, and also his holiness, and even his mercy as he doesn't pour out all of these judgments at once at the beginning, but they intensify in response to the hardening of people's hearts. What do these judgments show us about God's character and what warnings do they give us about sin and the results and consequences of our sin? Not just in the future, in the end times, but even now. That is some of the things that we're going to look at today. I'll invite you to join with me as we read Revelation 16. I'm going to read it in parts as we discuss each one of these bold judgments. So first, Revelation 16 verses 8 through 9. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were scorched by the fierce heat, and they cursed the name of God, who had power over these plagues. They did not repent and give him glory. So the fourth bowl judgment is a judgment which affects the sun, and it scorches the earth's population. This could be the result of extreme solar activity or perhaps solar flares. Uh, certainly won't be a comfortable thing. Recently, me and my family went to the beach and it was really, really hot. There was an intense sun in the middle day hours. And in fact, most people didn't even go out to the beach because it was so hot. I'm still quite tanned and all of my kids came back with their faces all peeling because of the sunburn which they got. But the worst, think of the worst sun that you have ever experienced, the most intense sunburn, and it's going to be that multiplied by 10 or a hundred fold. It's going to be really, really painful. We don't know the exact reason why this will happen except for the fact this is a supernatural act of God. It will be a nightmare scenario. Now, advances in science tend to cause the human race to become prideful. People believe they can overcome any obstacle that will come up. They believe they are masters of their fate, captains of the ship. Yet these plagues show us just how vulnerable we are. How big is the sun? Well, one million Earths would fit inside the sun. If the sun heats up or if it cools down, there's nothing people can do to stop it. With all of our modern technology, we will be completely helpless to find any solutions to this plague. An unbeliever might look at the vast universe and conclude that we are at complete, the complete mercy of Mother Nature. That's the wrong conclusion. The correct conclusion is that we are at the mercy of a divine creator. Think about how fragile life on earth is. If the atmosphere is damaged, we die. If the magnetic fields that protect the Earth's atmosphere from the sun's rays and harmful radiation, if that is weakened, we die. If the weather cycle gets messed up, we die. If the air we breathe or changes composition, if the air we breathe, sorry, is contaminated or changes composition, we die. If a large asteroid's orbit lines up with Earth, we die. If the sun heats up or cools off, we die. We're at the mercy of God. And to this point, God has chosen to be merciful. Every day when you go out and you see the beautiful sunrise, remember God's mercy. That this sunrise is evidence of his common grace, which he extends to all mankind, allowing you to live another day. Today, did you thank God for the day that you have? When I was a kid, I remember praying, and almost every day, I would start off my prayer, Dear God, thank you for this day. And just thanking God for the day is a way to remember that we're at His mercy, that every breath we take is because of Him. And as we see in Revelation, that mercy will not last forever. There will come a point when His patience runs out. 
and woe to the one who has not repented of his sin and comes into that day unprepared. So what application is there for us in this? Well, realizing that we are at the mercy of God is very humbling. There is no room for pride in the life of a believer. Every good and perfect gift is from above. So let's do away with our pride. Let's do away with relying on ourselves. The 21st century man is such a great believer in himself. In this country where I am, I can go around and ask people, what do you believe in or who do you believe in? And almost everyone will answer myself. I believe in me. This is pride. And these plagues will remind people that we, me, are not enough to overcome the obstacles and the problems we face. There are so many things outside of our control. We need to humble ourselves before the Lord and stop boasting about our accomplishments. But daily remember, we live for one reason, God's mercy. Now, if you look at verse 8, it says, The sun was allowed to scorch people with fire. The sun will only release more heat toward the earth because God will allow it. Every created thing is subject to God's divine will. And that's true even of the most celestial bodies in the universe. One million earths can fit in the sun. And five billion, five billion suns can fit in the largest known star, U-Y uh, Scuti or Scuti, S-C-U-T-I. That means that six quadrillion, 489 trillion earths could fit into U-Y Scuti. Yet that star, so massive, it's way beyond anything we can even comprehend, was made with a word by God. It cannot do anything. It cannot move unless he allows it to. Not one snowflake has ever fallen that God did not allow. The smallest of insects in the unseen atoms in the farthest reaches of space and the electron around those atoms does not move. One little tiny iota unless God allows it to. It's according to his design and his sovereign will. We are no different. We live because God allows us to. What's the application for us here? Well, we should always remember God is sovereign. He designed this incomprehensibly large universe for our enjoyment and to showcase his power. Did you ever stop back and think, why did God make the universe so big? It's huge. It's beyond our comprehension. Why did he make it so big? I think it's simple. He wanted to show how big he is. He wanted to show us how powerful he is and to teach us a certain amount of humility. But even though we're tiny in the universe, he loves us, he values us, and he has a plan for us. So we should praise him for his creation. Psalm 8, 4 through 6 says, What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with honor and glory. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. What is man that he is mindful of us? We are so small in the cosmos, and yet we are important. We are made in the image of God. He gives us value because he loves us. Now, how did people respond to this plague, to this bull judgment? Let's look at verse 9. It says, They were scorched by fierce heat, and they cursed the name of God. They did not repent and give him glory. The judgment did not change people's minds. Battle lines had already been drawn. Most of the earth's citizens have already decided at this point to cast their lot with Satan. They worship him. They've taken his mark. And there's no turning back. There seems to be no desire to ask for mercy or plead with God for forgiveness. Instead, they rage against God and they curse him. In short, they hate him. So when these judgments come, they're not like, it's not like they're, people are just begging God, forgive us, please, please. We were so sorry. We want to change. We just want to be part of your family. Just please give us one more chance. There's not any of this kind of pleading going on. 
it's only cursing and hating and blaspheming God all the more. They hate him because he's more powerful than they are. They hate him because he doesn't tolerate their sin. They hate him because he exists and they don't want him to. And that's the entire purpose of the theory of evolution is people want to do away with God. They want to be the top dog. They want to be the highest in the universe themselves. They want to have no authority higher than themselves. They want to be free to do what they want and not made to feel guilty about it, not have to answer to anyone else's standards. They hate God simply because he exists and they wish he didn't. They've already gone beyond the point of no return and none of them will turn to God. So it's not because they're begging for forgiveness and God refuses them. It's because they, at this point, they've rejected so many warnings from God. They've, they keep on hearing warnings and reminders and rejecting, rejecting, rejecting to the point where they're incapable of changing their minds and repenting. And there's a danger there. There's a danger and you should take that as a warning. If you willfully sin, if you willfully reject God's warnings over and over and over and over again, at some point you may also cross an invisible line where there is no return. Every subsequent judgment hardens their resolve to rebel against God. Let's look at the fifth judgment. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne, and the beast in its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in anguish and cursed the God of heaven for their pain and sores. They did not repent of their deeds. So the fifth bowl judgment is poured out on the throne of the beast and its kingdom. It's a direct judgment from God upon the world order that has set itself up in opposition to God with the Antichrist at its head. Darkness will cover this evil kingdom and it will be terrifying. Now it's interesting to note this plague is something like the opposite of the fourth bowl. The fourth bowl judgment was too much sun and this one will be too little sun. And so it's not the first time such a plague has descended upon the earth. In Exodus 10, God sent the plague upon the Egyptians, and that passage describes it as a darkness that can be felt. A darkness that can be felt. And it shows that God is in total and complete control of all of nature. The totally hardened person who wants to deny God's existence might, for example, claim, oh, it's just a, a random thing. You know, the sun is, is heating up. It's climate change. It's this or that, whatever. But right after that, God says, well, I can do it both ways. You know, I can have more hot, more sun, and I can also do less. So there's no natural explanation for these types of swings. It is God's supernatural power over nature. Now each person will be completely alone with his thoughts, his sin, and his guilt. There will be no escape. This plague reminds me of the darkness of hell. Uh, it's described in Matthew 8, 12 as being a place of elder darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So in hell, people will be totally alone, alone with their thoughts, alone with their regrets, alone with their guilt and their shame and their sin. And the same is true here. Now, we are reminded when we think about even why is hell forever? Why does hell last forever? Why doesn't it just last, you know, a thousand years and be done? Well, hell is a place where judgment is put out to sin. And so a certain sin may have a certain judgment, but in hell, people will continue sinning. They will continue sinning in hell forever. And because they continuously and forever add to their sins and never want to repent or, or turn or come out of there, um, not that they don't want to come out, but because they never stop sinning, okay? Because they always will continue to sin forever and ever into eternity in hell so the judgment goes on forever and ever. Now, don't quote me on that. That's not a direct scripture but it's just a, a logical idea of perhaps one reason why hell might last forever. And so we see that here in Revelation, that even when the judgments come, that doesn't mean people are going to repent. Someone would say, well, of course someone in hell is repentant, right? Not necessarily. We see here 
a taste of hell on earth and people are not repenting at all. Now, if you remember in the book of Exodus, when the darkness descended upon Egypt, there was a distinction and the Jews in their dwellings had light, but the Egyptians in their dwellings did not. God made a distinction in the two groups in how he treated them. Now, the fifth judgment here, the bull judgment, also specifically targets the throne of the beast and its kingdom. So it appears that there's a separation here too. If there are any believers left alive at this point who haven't been martyred yet, God will make a distinction between them and the unbelievers. And it's likely that somehow his believers will still be able to see. Now darkness is a symbol of sin, shame, guilt, judgment. It also symbolizes blindness and deception. Though the world will be deceived and live as blind followers of the blind, God's people will see the light. So this will be a visible reminder that those in the world, they are blinded to the truth, but God's people know the truth and see the light. Those whose eyes have been opened by the Lord will never live in darkness, but will experience the light directly from God's glorious presence forever. And later verses in Revelation tell us that Jesus and also God the Father, they will be the light into eternity forever. But if someone refuses to open their eyes, refuses to see the light, then their eyes will be shut in willful disobedience and they will be sentenced to the life that they have chosen, a life without light. So we see people's response. Once again, they curse, they gnaw their tongues and they curse the God of heaven for their pain and sores and they did not repent of their deeds. So you see the pain and the sore. So this that was the first bull judgment was the pain and the sores. Verse 2, he poured out his bowl on the earth and harmful and painful sores came upon the people. So this judgment is still going on. The first judgment is still going on when the fifth judgment is going on. So Sometimes we think of, okay, there's one judgment and then it's done and then there's a gap and then there's another judgment. Not necessarily. Some of the judgments overlap. And so this first judgment overlaps with at least the first five. So the cumulative effect of these judgments is overwhelming. People are living in anguish, but still no repentance. People are just growing more and more angry with God and cursing him. Let's go to the sixth bowl judgment. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs for they are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be exposed. And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. So the result of the sixth bold judgment is that the Euphrates River is dried up. Now notice it says that its water is dried up. In the third bold judgment, the fresh water turned to blood. So this might indicate that the third bowl is a temporary plague and God has already restored the waters. Now, the river Euphrates predominantly runs north to south, uh, east of Jerusalem. So if Jerusalem is here and the Euphrates is over here, then it provides a natural barrier between Israel and the Far East. So any invasion force from the Far East would have to find a way to get all their troops across the river. And that would be made more difficult because of the earthquake and the sixth seal judgment would have likely destroyed many, many bridges. Now on the surface, it looks like this bold judgment helps Israel's enemies. Well, it basically, it clears the path. It removes the largest natural obstacle, which is protecting Jerusalem from attack. But actually it makes it easier for these enemies of Israel to gather a massive force together. 
It looks like that's bad for Jerusalem, but God actually wants to gather together all of these forces so that he can judge them in the same place at the same time. So this apparent good fortune for the Antichrist's forces is not actually good for them at all. It's a trap. God is going to allow these forces to muster and to march on Israel in order to gather them all in one place for their final judgment. He wants them to come. All of their elaborately hatched schemes, their skillful tactics just play right into God's hand. Now, this is quite funny and, and strange if you think about it. God announces these plans in the Bible long before it happens. Satan is not stupid. The devil knows God's word. He's read it before. He's read this plan out. But yet he and his forces are still going to fall for it. They are still going to gather all of these forces together and come to Armageddon. Well, you can't say Satan is really, really smart. Um, he is really, really prideful. He will be so confident in his power and the forces that he can marshal that somehow he thinks he can still beat God even though God said this exact thing was coming. That's the level of pride that Satan has. Now, who are the kings of the East? Scripture doesn't say. Uh, India and China are currently the two largest and most powerful nations to the East that might be well equipped to launch a ground invasion against Israel through the Euphrates. A closer nation to the East that's long been an enemy of Israel is Iran. It really doesn't matter. I mean, we don't need to speculate on what the nations will be, what the makeup of the world will even be at this time is could be very, very different from right now. So we don't really need to speculate on that very much. But the point is that there will be armies who will come to Jerusalem to try to wipe it off the map. Now, what we see here is that these nations and these armies will be seduced to come. Out of the mouth of the dragon and the beast are coming three unclean spirits like frogs. And they are demonic spirits. They will perform signs and they will go abroad to the kings of the whole world in order to try to assemble them for battle. So Satan and the false prophet, the Antichrist, they're going to be sending demons out into the world to seduce, to influence the kings of the world to send their armies. So while God is working, Satan is not napping. There's a battle. God has his plans and Satan has his Satan wants to unite the world together against God in one epic battle that he somehow still believes that he can win. It's apparent that his minion, the Antichrist, may not be so popular as he once was because now people are not willfully and joyfully sending their sons off to battle. No, they have to be convinced. They not only have to be convinced through PR, through news or through media, or through propaganda, they actually have to be convinced through demonic spirits infiltrating their minds and deceiving them to send the troops. So it seems certainly at this point that the Antichrist isn't so po popular. And why would he be? Since he's come onto the scene and led this one world coalition, look at the total, total disaster the world is in. It's in a complete state of ruin. Far, far worse than what Germany or Japan were in the late stages of World War II. Now history teaches us that when a war goes badly, it becomes hard to hide the truth. Morale fades and dictators live in fear of coups, schemes, and betrayal. There's less will to fight. Now normally in these times, the corrupt regimes scale up their propaganda and the war is fought on multiple fronts. So one of those battlefronts is the minds of the people. Satan knows this and he's no stranger to deceitful propaganda. Normal media will be controlled by him. But it won't be enough. To win the minds of people across the world, he will send out demons throughout the earth. They will use various tools of deception, including miraculous signs. Whatever supernatural abilities they have will be on public display for all to see. So this will be one last ditch attempt by Satan to muster troops for war. His goal, 
get them to join in battle. He wants every man, every woman, every weapon he can get to get as big of a military as he can possibly get with as many guns, as many tanks, as many bombs and missiles and nuclear bombs and everything he can get together to try to crush the Jews and defeat God once and for all. But it seems people aren't so eager to enlist. Satan needs to resort to spiritual mind games, brainwashing, propaganda, intimidation, and fear. Now, the only thing that's powerful enough to stop this kind of demonic influence is the power of God. But God's not going to stop it. He will allow it to happen, letting people go their own way and then reaping the consequences of their choices. Now, there's a reminder for us now, and that is Satan is active. Satan's active. Right now, Satan and his demons are active in the world. They hate God, they hate the followers of God, and their goal is to fight against God and against his kingdom. They enjoy nothing more than seeing believers sin and seeing unbelievers with hard hearts reject the gospel. Satan uses every tool in his kit. You can think, what are the tools Satan is using to attack you and your family even today? Now, because they can't defeat God, the next best thing that they can hope for is to defeat God's followers. And this is a way to strike at the heart of God because he is grieved when we fall. So these are very spiteful and very miserable beings. Misery enjoys company. And his strategies are effective. They worked in the Garden of Eden and they've worked countless times since then. That's the adversary that we have. What can we do about it? Well, the power of God. The power of God can resist them. So we need to put on the armor of God and fight. When we do fight, we do so by the power of the Holy Spirit. If we depend on ourselves, we are doomed to fail. How can we be sure that we're not deluded or influenced by evil spiritual forces? We need to study God's word and pray day by day by day for wisdom and for discernment so that we are not influenced by his ideas. And so he tells us in verse 15, Blessed is the one who stays awake. Stays awake. How to stay awake? Well, we need to know ourselves well. That means we should know our weaknesses and areas of temptation. Then we need to make sure we stay far away from the temptations that are worse for us. When you think about the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane when they were praying when Jesus was about to be taken prisoner, Jesus said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You know, they laid out on the nice green grass under the shady tree with a nice cool breeze coming through and started to pray. That didn't work so well. As we know, they fell asleep. We sometimes do the same thing. Fluff up your pillow, turn on the AC, uh, get a nice shower, get a nice cup of tea, uh, lay down in your soft bed, put on some gentle music in the background, and open the Bible and start to read. Hmm. Most likely, you're going to be falling asleep. So if you really want to have a good quality time praying or reading the words, you need to do it in a place that you are not so comfortable. Stay awake. Know your areas of temptation and then avoid them. Make no opportunity for the flesh. Two are better than one. If you're going to come into a situation that you know is going to be a temptation, well, first choice is don't go there. But if you, if God is calling you like to go witnessing, whatever, take along another believer. For example, uh, as a man, I don't meet with women one-on-one -on -one, even for the sake of doing things like sharing the gospel or praying or discipleship. Instead, I would take along my wife with me. And you can take along a buddy or a friend or a spouse in order to limit temptation. Now, part of being alert is having an escape plan ready to go. That means we know what to do when temptation comes. For me, when I fly on an airplane or I get on a bus, I often look around to see where are the escape doors and what's the easiest path to get there so that if the worst happens, then I will have at least some idea of where to go or what to do. And that can cut down on indecision and reaction times. We should do this about temptation as well. When you face temptation, what should you do? Some things could include run. Like Joseph, when he was tempted by Potiphar's wife, he ran out of there. He got out of the house. 
pray. We sometimes a very simple prayer. Jesus, help me. Call another Christian for help and encouragement. Once a friend called me up and said, I, I have to pass through this area that has something tempting there. I have to pass through there on the way home. Please call me in 10 minutes just to make sure I didn't fall into that temptation. And read scripture. Think about a lion. Lions are dangerous creatures. Lions and wild animal trainers try every trick in the book to tame them. So even though wild animal tamers tame lions, that's their job, still you can sometimes read news stories about lion tamers who were killed by the lion. Most of the time it's because for just a moment they were not alert. And the lion chose that moment to attack. Let's not give Satan the opportunity. This passage says, stay awake. So if you want, you can pause the video now for just a moment and write down a couple of ways that you can stay awake. Write down some practical ways that you can stay alert and write down an escape plan for a common temptation that you face. Moving on in the passage, we see in verse 16, Armageddon. You're probably familiar with this term. This is the Valley of Megiddo, where one front of the last battle will take place between Jesus and the Antichrist's massive assembled army. We're not going to go into detail in this battle today. In later chapters, especially chapter 19, we will see part of this battle play out. Now, let's move forward to the seventh bowl judgment. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, It is done. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a great earthquake such as there had never been since man was on the earth. So great was that earthquake. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And God remembered Babylon the Great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. And every island fled away, and no mountains were to be found. And great hailstones, about 100 pounds each, fell from heaven on people. And they cursed God for the plague of the hail, because the plague was so severe. The loud voice comes out of heaven and says, it is done. The seventh bold judgment ends the series of 21 supernatural judgments where God pours out his wrath on the world. A terrifying ending. Lightning, thunder, massive earthquake. It seems quite similar to the sixth seal judgment, which also features an earthquake that affects the mountains and the islands. So there's different ways to interpret it. Some believe this is the same event. Again, this is the cyclical idea that these judgments are repeated. Um, they, they're being repeated from different perspectives as John records these different accounts. And then other main interpretations, these are separate but very similar events. And the second event is an intensification of the first one. Now, the most similar part of these earthquakes is the fact that they both affect mountains and islands. Yet the Greek word used is not the same. We'll just have a brief comparison in Revelation 6.14. says, The sky vanished like a scroll that's being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. And the NASB translate that as moved out of its place. And here in chapter 16, verse 20, it says that the, the island fled away and no mountains were to be found. So not found is more serious and extreme than moved out of their places. Now, it seems that the first earthquake shakes and moves the entire earth. So the mountains and the islands are moving and changing locations. They're left changed, bruised, beaten crumbling perhaps. But the second earthquake finishes them off to the point where they can't even be found. Mount Everest, gone. Hawaii, gone. They will vanish from the earth. The power needed to cause this is immense. Thus this global catastrophe will be even greater than any seen ever before. 
And this reminds us of this escalation of intensity that I talked about in the last lesson, the first part of Revelation 16, where we see each series of seven judgments escalates the scale and the intensity of those judgments. As people continue to ignore God's warnings, their culpability and hence the severity of judgment goes up. Now we see that the city is split into three parts. Most likely, this great city is a reference to Jerusalem, which will not totally escape God's judgment. And it says that God remembered Babylon the great. For God's enemies, it's a scary thing to be remembered by God. They would rather just slink away into the darkness unobserved. But it's not going to happen. As God remembers the wicked nation, he's going to dump his entire cup of fury on it. It says to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. Drain. Empty it out. Every last drop of wrath will be poured out upon her. And then it says there are great hailstones, about 100 pounds each. Scholars disagree about sometimes about how much of Revelation to take literally and how much to take figuratively. Some argue that the earthquake, the hail, the thunder, the lightning are figurative. But if that's the case, if this hail is figurative, then why describe the weight of the hail? What significance would a 100 pound of figurative hail have? What would that even mean? If hail is some other aspect of God's judgment, then what does it mean that it's 100 pounds? So it doesn't make sense to record the weight of the hail unless it's real. When 100 pound hailstones start to drop, the most fervent God denier will not have a leg to stand on. The precision of the prophecies once fulfilled will bring glory to God. Now the largest hailstone on record fell in South Dakota in 2010. It was 8 inches or that's 20 centimeters in diameter and it weighed almost 2 pounds or 1 kilo. Large hailstones in this size are sometimes put in their own category called gargantuan hail. Now the hail in Revelation will be 50 times heavier than the largest hailstone ever recorded in history. That is apocalyptic hail. Woe to the one who doesn't know God when this happens. What is people's response? When the things get so, so bad, do they finally come to God and repent and ask for another chance? Sadly, they don't. It says they cursed God for the plague of the hail. They cursed God. Still, no repentance, no recognition of sin, no throwing themselves upon the mercy of God, only bitterness and hatred. So this chapter is another reminder that God takes sin very seriously. So should we. What lesson can you learn from this chapter, these apocalyptic and terrifying events Learn this lesson. Sin is not a light matter. Too often we take a casual attitude towards sin, thinking, I can do it now and I can repent later. Perhaps these people thought the same thing. I'll enjoy all the pleasures of the flesh now and then later before Jesus comes. After all, we know it's about seven years. At the end of that, I'll repent before he returns. This is a dangerous, dangerous thought. Sinning willfully is a dangerous thing. Let's be quick to confess our sins. So, what practical application can we make from the passage today? I'll give you one practical application. Be quick to confess your sins. Confess your sins each night before you go to sleep. Don't keep them over to the next day. One way I myself need to do that is sometimes when I lose temper with my children or get upset, I try to confess to them as soon as I think about it, as soon as I realize that this is wrong. Whatever area that you are sinning or struggling with, be quick to confess to God. Confess to God and be quick to confess to the person you sinned against. Uh, this chapter is quite sad and quite gloomy, but at the same time, it's vital because it reminds us of the consequences of sin so that we don't go down that road. I hope that this chapter was very beneficial for you and I would invite you to join us next time as we will study Revelation chapter 17. Until then, may God bless you. See you next time.